This is going to be about why do I use and make a big deal about the King James Bible. And I just want to give you a few examples why, because I'm constantly getting new listeners who have no idea why I make a big deal about the King James. So every now and then I like to do a little study on this and show them. Well, the first thing, why do I use the King James Bible is because in the King James, the Savior is maximized. It makes the Savior look like who he is, the God of this world, the King of Kings, God Almighty, God manifest in the flesh. If you look, really look at your Bibles and turn with me. In 1 Timothy 3.16, it says, Without controversy, great is the mystery of godliness. God was manifest in the flesh, justified in the Spirit, seen of angels, preached unto the Gentiles, believed on in the world, received up into glory. The Savior, Jesus Christ, is maximized. Notice here in 1 Timothy 3.16, it plainly says, God was manifest in the flesh. That means God came down in the flesh. He was revealed in the flesh. Through who? The Lord Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ is God manifest in the flesh. And the Bible plainly tells you that and shows you that. If you've got a King James Bible. But the same verse in the NIV 1 Timothy 3.16 in the NIV, the New International Version, says this, Beyond all question, the mystery from which true godliness springs is great. He appeared in the flesh. So it takes out God and puts He. A, a subtle attack on the Godhood of the Lord Jesus. Instead of putting God was manifested in the flesh, it put He appeared in the flesh. Why? Would you take out God and put He? They say the NIV is easier to understand. He's not. E this is not easier to understand. The King James makes it clear what's what it's talking about. God is manifest in the flesh. If you look at Philippians two five through six in your King James, it says, "Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God." thought it not robbery to be equal with God. So God manifested in himself in the flesh, the Lord Jesus. And Jesus Christ thought it not robbery to be equal with God. Jesus Christ knew he was God. He claimed to be God. He claimed to be the Son of God. He knew it wasn't robbery he, to claim to, for him to be equal with God. But that's not what your ESV says. The same verse in Philippians 2, 6 in an English standard version says, Who, though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped. That's something completely different you got there in Philippians. A subtle attack on the deity, the Godhood of the Lord Jesus. Now, the virgin birth. You know, if you've been a Bible believer for a while, you know that Jesus Christ was born of a virgin. You know that he did not have an earthly father. God was his father. And in Isaiah 7, 14, it plainly tells you this. It says, Therefore the Lord himself shall give you a sign. Behold, a virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and shall call his name Emmanuel. It plainly said, A virgin shall conceive. That's not what it says in your RSV the Revised Standard Version. In Isaiah 7, 14, it says, Though therefore the Lord himself will give you a sign, behold, a young woman shall conceive and bear a son and shall call his name Emmanuel. Why did it take out virgin? That changed it. It just says a young woman shall conceive and bear a son. Our King James plainly says, a virgin shall conceive, showing you the deed to the Lord Jesus Christ, that God was his father, why would the Revised Standard Version want to attack the virgin birth of Jesus? You tell me. Luke 2.33, in your King James Bible, it says, And Joseph and his mother marveled at those things which were spoken of him. Plainly showing you that Joseph, which was Mary's husband, was not God, uh, God's father, not the father of the Lord Jesus. Because it says, and Joseph and his mother marveled at those things which were spoken of him. But that's not how it goes in the New International Version. In the NIV, in Luke 2.33, it says, the child's father and mother marveled 
at what was said about him. So it makes Joseph Jesus' father. When the King James plainly shows you that Joseph is not Jesus' father. And then in your King James, in Luke 2, 48 through 49, it says, And when they saw him, they were amazed. And his mother said unto him, Son, why hast thou thus dealt with us? Behold, thy father and I have sought thee sorrowing. So it, uh, according to uh, the storyline here, Mary is the one that calls Joseph Jesus' father. She says, Thy father and I have sought thee sorrowing. But look how Jesus corrects her. He says, And he said unto them, How is it that ye sought me? Wish ye not that I must be about my, capital F, father's business. Jesus is kindly, gently rebuking what his mother said and says that he's about his father's business, showing her Joseph is not his father. He knows that Joseph is not his father. And the King James Bible plainly shows you that Joseph isn't his father. In Luke 3.23, it says, And Jesus himself began to be about 30 years of age, being as was supposed the son of Joseph, which was the son of Heli. So, as people supposed he was, if they didn't believe he was the son of God. Now, the next thing. Your Bible in Colossians 1.14 plainly says, In whom we have redemption through his blood, even the forgiveness of sins. That's not what it says in the New American Standard Bible. It says, His beloved Son, in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. Why did it take out the blood? Why does it take out the blood in all these modern versions of the Bible? And sure, it says it says things about the blood in other places, but I want, I want it talking about it in all the places that it's supposed to. Here it took it out, in whom we have redemption through His blood. It took out the through his blood. Ain't that strange? That's because a lot of people don't believe the blood is significant. They think it was just the death of Jesus. But the blood is significant. In Matthew 5.22 it says, But I say unto you that whosoever is angry with his brother without a cause shall be in danger of the judgment. So Jesus said, Whosoever is angry with his brother without a cause shall be in danger of the judgment. That's not what the NIV says, it says, but I tell you that anyone who is angry with a brother or sister will be subject to judgment, making it look like all anger is bad. I mean, that's a big difference. It's a difference between being angry without a real cause versus being angry for no reason. And I mean, this makes Jesus look like a sinner himself because Jesus got angry. He went, th he went through there and overthrew the tables of the money changers and made a scourge of small cords. He got angry and, and strong with people, but he wasn't angry without a cause. In Matthew 5, 22, it takes out that without a cause. And that can make Jesus even look like a, a sinner. But that's why I use the King James. The Savior is maximized. He's made to be God of gods, Lord of lords, King of kings. But in the new versions, he's watered down a little bit. The world likes to water down your Savior. The next reason I love the King James and I use the King James and make a big deal about the King James is because in the King James, Satan is minimized. He just looks worse and worse and worse as you go along. In Isaiah 14, 12, in your King James, it says, How art thou fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning? How art thou cut down to the ground, which didst weaken the nations? Notice it calls him son of the morning. That's not what the other versions call him. In the New International Version, it calls him Morning Star, Son of the Dawn. In the New Living Translation, it calls him O Shining Star, Son of the Morning. In the English Standard Version, it calls him O Day Star, O Son of Dawn. In the Berean Study Bible, it calls him O Day Star, Son of Dawn. So it calls him Morning Star, it calls him Shining Star, and it calls him Day Star. It gives him titles that are given to the Lord Jesus only. For example, in your King James, in 2 Peter 1.19, it calls the Lord Jesus the day star. In Revelation 22.16, it calls Jesus the bright and morning star. So why is it that the new versions want to give titles to Satan that are actually titles for the Lord Jesus?
That's a strange thing. Very strange. But Satan is Satan is maximized in the new versions. But in the King James, he's minimized. He's made to look worse and worse and worse. And I understand that what I'm saying to the average here is going to be very narrow-minded and they're not going to like what I have to say. But it's the truth. So the Savior is maximized. Satan is minimized in the King James. And the next thing, why am I King James? Because I believe the scriptures are preserved. In Psalm 12, 6 through 7, the words of the Lord are pure words, as silver tried in a furnace of earth, purified seven times. Thou shalt keep them, O Lord. Thou shalt preserve them from this generation forever. So what I believe is, there was a day when Moses and Paul and Luke and John and all the writers of the Bible, they got a, a piece of paper and they wrote down what God told them to write down. And I believe that from that time until now, God has kept that word completely intact without error. And it's it, we have it today. I have the same words that they wrote down. I don't believe there's any errors. I, don't, I believe that God had a hand in it and made sure it was translated properly. I just, I accept that by faith. Now, there is faith involved in this. I accept it by faith. Just like I accepted Jesus Christ as my Savior, by faith. I accept by faith that God promised to preserve His Word all the way until now. But what we have now, we got so many different versions of the Bible, and they all say something completely different, as I've showed you, so not all of them can be right, but one of them is right. But you, when people use the new versions, uh, they don't believe that God has the perfect word today. They believe that there's errors in it. They believe there's good translations and bad translations. So they don't have faith in a preserved 100% right word of God. See, that's the problem. If, you're, if you believe the King James... And you not only just use it, but believe it. Then you believe you have exactly what God said. And Paul, he didn't just have, he didn't have the original copies of what Moses wrote. And he still believed that the scriptures were holy. He calls them holy scriptures. In Romans chapter 1 and verse 2, he calls them holy scriptures. If something's holy, it's whole and entire and perfect. So he called them holy scriptures i believe these are holy scriptures if they had errors and lies and everything else in it then they're not holy he also says to timothy in second timothy 4 2 to preach the word he tells timothy to preach the word how can timothy preach the word if he doesn't have it paul believes it was preserved uh, in Luke 4, 4, Jesus said, and uh, Jesus answered him saying, It is written, Thou shalt not live by bread alone, but by every word of God. Every word of God is pure. So, how can you live by every word of God if you don't have it? If, if things got missing throughout time, then how can you live by every word of God? Men who use the modern versions do not believe we have a perfect, without error word of God. They may be good men. They may be great men. They may be loving men. They may love God, and they may have great ministries and things like that, but they don't believe the Bible. I want to believe the Bible. A Bible believer simply believes that we have exactly what God wanted us to have, and we have it without error. And if so much of it is a bad translation, then how do we know any of it is right? If the King James has errors in it, just like the other versions, that how do we know what to believe and what not to believe? It come it would come down to us being our own final authority in a way and determining for ourselves what's right and wrong. You see, what they believe is that the Word of God was inspired in their originals only. And that's what they say. If you look at their website, it says, We believe the Word of God is perfect and inspired without error in the originals. But we don't just believe it was perfect in the originals. We believe it was perfect in the originals and it's still perfect today because God preserved it, had his hand on it, took care of it all the way through time, even until our time today. That's why I can proclaim boldly the gospel 
and the faith that I believe, because I believe the Bible is without error. So the scriptures are preserved. In the King James, if, I, if I've got a King James, the Savior is maximized. Satan is minimized. The scriptures are preserved. And the last thing, salvation is clear. In 1 Corinthians 1.18, here's an example. In your King James, it says, For the preaching of the cross is to them that perish foolishness, but unto us which are saved... It is the power of God. You see, if you're saved, you are saved. If you believe the gospel, you are saved presently. Not so in the NIV. In the NIV, in the same verse, it says, For the message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing. But to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. Notice that change there of adding a word. It, it added being saved. The King James says, which are saved. The NIV says, who are being saved. Now, that makes it seem like a process, or maybe if you're, you're working towards it or something like that. That's not clear. The, the King James is clear. It says, unto us, which are saved. It is the power of God. The NIV says, who are being saved. You see, that's not clear Bible teaching. There's other parts of the NIV, I believe, where it says, which are saved. So which is it? Which are saved or which are being saved? That's not clear. You know, salvation's clear in the King James. It plainly says, which are saved. And I saved the best one for last, the biggest one. I mean, if most of the modern versions take out whole verses. I mean, in the NIV, it goes Acts chapter 8, 36, Acts chapter 8, 38. Completely takes out Acts chapter 8, verse 37. And in Acts chapter 8, 37, it's the great verse. You know the story, the Ethiopian eunuch is sitting in his chariot, and he's reading in the book of Isaiah, and the Lord sends Philip. And Philip comes and gives the gospel to this Ethiopian eunuch. Using the book of Isaiah, he shows him that Jesus Christ is God. He shows him that Jesus Christ died for him. And in Acts chapter 8, 37, the Ethiopian eunuch believes, and this is what he says, And Philip said, If thou believest with all thine heart, thou mayest. And he answered and said, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. This verse is taken out in your NIV and in your new versions of the Bible, in most of them. And that right there is enough for me to not want them. I mean, I just need... I, did, I mean, just one of these examples that I've shown you would be enough for me to say, hey, I, I'm King James. I mean, I remember when I first got saved, I had no idea, absolutely no idea that you were just supposed to use the King James. I had no idea. And then I, I was looking on the, that this website on the, <coughs> on the Internet. I believe it was the Jesus is Savior website by David J. Stewart. And he had articles on there, a whole section, just showing you where the King James is what you need to use, and uh, the new versions are bad. I had no idea. But uh, the moment I was showed that, I instantly just changed my mind. I, I mean, it was, it was obvious. Don't be so... You know, they accuse us of being closed-minded. But you're the one being closed-minded if you're not going to just acknowledge this evidence that I've given you here. If you believe the NIV is right, then the rest of them can't be right. If that's the one you want to use, then if that's the one you got faith in that's right, I mean, that's you. But you can't say all of them are right. That doesn't make any sense because they all say something completely different. They all take out verses. They all take out different verses. I mean, there can only be one that's right. But I feel like I've showed you enough evidence to prove to you that the King James is the one you want to use. And I'm not an expert on the on the King James Bible in the, in that way of like, you know, like a Sam Gipp and William Grady and all those guys. Get some of their books by Sam Gipp, William Grady, Peter Ruckman. Get the answer book by Sam Gipp, all those books. And you'll, you'll, you'll clearly see even further. They can explain it to you a lot better than I can about why the King James is, a, is the Bible you need to use today.